2 Kings chapter 5, verses 1 through 27. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and in high favor, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Now the Syrians on one of their raids had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel, and she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, would that my Lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria. He would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his Lord, thus and so spoke the girl from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, go now and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he went, taking with him 10 talents of silver 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 changes of clothing. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you Naaman, my servant, that you may cure him of leprosy. And when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive? that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Only consider and see how is he seeking a quarrel with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent to the king saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come now to me, that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored and you shall be clean. But Naaman was angry and went away saying, behold, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord, his God, and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Parfar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned away and went away in rage. But his servants came near and said to him, My father, it is... A great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? He has actually said to you, wash and be clean. So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. Then he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and he came and stood before him. And he said, Behold, I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. So accept now a present from your servant. But he said, As the Lord lives, before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it. But he refused. Then Naaman said, If not, please let there be given to your servants two mule loads of earth. For from now on your servant will not offer burnt offerings or sacrifice to any god but the Lord. In this matter, may the Lord pardon your servant. When my master goes into the house of Rimon to worship there, leaning on my arm, and I bow myself in the house of Rimon, when I bow myself in the house of Rimon, the Lord, pardon your servant in this manner. He said to him, go in peace. But when Naaman had gone from him a short distance, Gehazi, the servant of Elijah, the man of God, said, see, my master has spared this Naaman the Syrian 
in not accepting from his hand what he brought. As the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. So Gehazi followed Naaman. And when Naaman saw someone running after him, he got down from the chariot to meet him and said, Is all well? And he said, All is well. My master has sent me to say, There have just now come to me from the hill country of Ephraim two young men of the sons of the prophets. Please give them a talent of silver and two changes of clothing. And Naaman said, Be pleased to accept two talents. And he urged him and tied up two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of clothing and laid them on two of his servants and they carried them before Gehazi. And when he came to the hill, he took them from their hand and put them in a house and he sent the men away and they departed. He went in and stood before his master and Elisha said to him, where have you been, Gehazi? And he said, your servant went nowhere. But he said to him, Did not my heart go when the man turned from his chariot to meet you? Was it a time to accept money and garments, olive orchards and vineyards, sheep and oxen, male servants and female servants? Therefore, the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and to your descendants forever. So he went out from his presence, a leper, like snow. May God richly bless the reading and the hearing of his word. Would you pray with me one more time? <clears throat> oh God, we do need you now. Spirit of the living God, come open our hearts, our ears, and our eyes to see the greatness of your grace in this glorious text. Speak now, Lord, for your servants are listening. And we pray this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. <clears throat> Oops, sorry. Go back. Hmm, I'll start. The phrase, come as you are, that's become a popular slogan in our day. Come as you are. It's welcoming. It's inviting. I'm sure, you've exceed, I'm sure you've seen that expression somewhere. In fact, at GBC, we even sing those words in a song, come as you are. But have, you ever, have you ever given much thought to what that phrase means? What are we, the church, actually saying when we post and display and sing this phrase, come as you are? Well, after being on several road trips in the month of June, I couldn't help but ask this question. Whether it was in Canada or Kentucky or North Carolina or even here in Midlothian, I saw these words, come as you are, hanging from church buildings all over. Interesting, though, was the different ways this expression was being presented. Some come as you are signs were pretty generic. You know, worship at 1045, come as you are. That's all it said. Others, however, were, were decorated with rainbows and peace signs. Come as you are. Another sign, maybe feeling a need to clarify, said, come as you are, but don't leave as you came. Well, I found this interesting. It's the same phrase. It's being used all over the place. But I don't think everyone means the same thing by it. And so should we stop saying it? Should we stop singing this song? Well, before you answer that question, just note the last song we're going to sing in your bulletin today, okay? <clears throat> it's at my request, so you can blame me. But in all seriousness, there is a biblical truth that can be beautifully expressed by this phrase, and it's not God is so proud of you, come inside, he just can't wait to meet you. No, that's not it. But it's this, that you, even you, the way you are can come to God. You see, the real question this morning is not, is that a good or bad phrase, but rather this, do you understand who you are? Do you understand what your true condition is before a holy God? 
And if that condition is made known to you, even if it shocks or surprises you, will that God still receive you? Can you come to him then even as you are? Well, the incredible answer that this text gives us is that yes, God will have you, he will help you, he will save you, get this, only if you come to him as you are. And how are you? You are helpless, sinful, and in desperate need of mercy. And we're going to see this in 2 Kings 5 this morning. Our main point is stop trying to help yourself, humble yourself. Come to Jesus as you really are sinful, broken, and in desperate need of mercy because that is the kind of person who God saves. Our pride must be leveled to come to a God of grace, but oh, when it is, what joy God has in helping and saving sinners. And so we're going to go through this text seeing four requirements for coming to a God of grace. The first is that we bring nothing to the table. Bring nothing to the table. Look at verse 1. Our passage begins by introducing our main character, who is Naaman. Verse 1 says, Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria. Now, just briefly, for those who like a map, the events of this chapter take place in three locations, just to give you kind of a a bird's eye view. So Naaman is from Damascus, from Syria, and that some translations call Aram. It's the same, same place. And that's where Naaman is from. Well, second, we're going to move down to Samaria. That's where Elisha lives. That's the capital of Israel, some 120 miles south. Interesting. Um, And third, we're going to do this quick little out and back to the Jordan River. That's 30 miles east. And so these are the places where this story uh, transpires in this text this morning. But back to Naaman, look at verse 1. We'll read the whole verse. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and in high favor, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Naaman was a great man with a great need. Notice first his resume. Naaman was Syria's top military commander. He was in high favor with the king. He won every battle. He's got everything going for him. Of course, all of this thanks to the Lord, by the way. The Lord is the one who's really in control of Naaman and his victories and his battles, as the author lets us know. But in man's eyes, Naaman was impressive. But look at the end of verse 1. There's a problem. And in five words, everything else said about Naaman is made completely irrelevant. We read, but he was a leper. And based on what we read, we know that Naaman had a particularly severe case of leprosy. He had a bad case of it. And I say bad case because leprosy in biblical times was a broad term. It's kind of like the way we use the word cancer. If you said that you had leprosy, you would likely be asked, well, what kind? How bad is it? How long have you had it? The term leprosy covered many types of skin diseases, and you can read all about it in Leviticus chapter 13. Well, understand, it was only the aggressive, the spreading, the flesh-destroying, if I could use a technical term, the the really gross kind. That, That was the only kind that would cast one out of Israelite society. Eventually, it would even take your life. With this said, leprosy, no matter what kind of it you had, it was a dreaded disease. The the reality is, is that when a spot or a rash appeared on your skin, you panicked. You didn't know, was this just a loss of pigment? Or is this leading to something worse going on below the surface that's going to lose my limbs or even my life? You didn't know. So lepers lived in constant fear. And Naaman, as I said, he seems to have had a bad case of it because according to verse 10, Naaman needed his flesh restored or literally returned. He had an aggressive form and he was in a desperate situation. And in this way, does not leprosy picture a disease that all of us have, namely sin? Sin has made us unclean before God, no exceptions. 
Sin is hard to trace. Sin lives deep within us. It takes various shapes. It affects your future, and ultimately, sin leads to death. Understand this. Sin, it has no respect for your accomplishments. Maybe you've been a faithful provider. Maybe you have advanced college degrees. Maybe your job contributes an important service to the community. That's all wonderful. But understand, Naaman, despite his greatness, and you, despite what LinkedIn says, no matter how much we have done to flatter ourselves or all the important things we've accomplished, there is an asterisk at the end of your long list of achievements, and it reads like this. Note, but he was a sinner. I want to ask you this morning, do you see your sin problem? It's easy to see Naaman's problem, but examine your life. Compare yourself, not not to Hitler, not to some crazy person on the news. Compare yourself to a holy God. Compare yourself by the standard by which you will one day be judged, which is perfection. Anyone falling short of God's standard has a great need. And so come to verses 2 and 3. We'll continue reading. The story goes on. Now the Syrians on one of their raids had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel. And she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, Would that my Lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria. He would cure him of his leprosy. Well, these verses are really incredible. I mean, Naaman, this mighty warlord is given hope by who? The little girl that he kidnapped. Despite all Naaman did to her, she points him to the one person who can heal him, namely Elisha. And understand that her faith is truly incredible because note this, there are no recorded instances in the Old Testament of any leper ever being healed. She has great faith. She knows that Yahweh is a God of love, even for the Gentiles. Now, I love how her faith was displayed in such a simple act. And I think that we would do well, you and I, to follow this little servant girl's lead. You see, sometimes it seems so often that we want to dream up these heroic, great evangelistic acts, you know, the things that we never get around to doing. We're going to go knock on every door in Midlothian We're going to bake cookies for every person in our neighborhood and distribute them out with gospel tracts and have a Bible study ready to go, and it's going to be amazing, and then we don't do it. Now understand, all this girl does is tell the beggar in her life where to find the bread. Now certainly, you're welcome to go do the extraordinary. Your faithfulness can look heroic, but it doesn't have to. Faithfulness could be giving your colleague a Bible, handing your neighbor a tract, inviting your friend to church, asking someone, how can I pray for you? We as the people of God need to do and say something to the people that God has placed in our lives, but understand we are just planting the seed and we're trusting God to do the heroic work. Now look at verse four and five. So Naaman hears this this offer of this man who can heal him. And so Naaman went in and told his Lord, thus and so spoke the girl from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he went, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 changes of clothing. Now just understand that Naaman going to Israel is shocking in and of itself. And this is the general who once raided Israel. He goes at the word of an Israelite captive seeking help from Israel's prophet. I mean, is he out of his mind? (laughs) Is this a trap? Or maybe, maybe Naaman's leprosy has softened him. Maybe now he's a humble beggar for God's mercy. Well, I actually don't think any of those are true. Not yet. Naaman isn't humble yet. But he is desperate, and understand this, desperate people do what? Desperate things. (laughs) You see in verse 5 that Naaman doesn't come expecting a handout. Naaman's not coming for mercy. 
To Naaman, to a, a great act such as curing leprosy must come at a great price. And thankfully for Naaman, he's got the money. In silver and gold, Naaman brings what would today be worth over $5 million. And, and that doesn't even count the 10 changes of clothes, which, you know, who knows, he might have shopped at a really nice store. That, that could have been worth a lot of money. And Naaman's bringing everything. I'm going to earn this. I'm going to buy this. You're not just going to hand this to me. Well, in addition to money, Naaman brings a letter. Look at verse 6. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you Naaman my servant, that you may cure him of his leprosy. Verse 7, and when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, am I God to kill and make alive that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Only consider and see how he is seeking a quarrel with me. You notice how the king of Israel, this guy's name was Joram, notice how he responds. He compares curing leprosy to killing someone and raising them from the dead. That's how unheard of this is. He's saying, who do you think I am? Only God can do that. And so all the king can think is, this must be some sinister plot. Clearly you, clearly you don't think we can cure leprosy. Something else is going on. And truly, from the king's point of view, just think, he's in a, he's in a lose-lose situation. If the king says, I can't cure you, well, that's humiliating. If the king says, I won't cure you, cure you, well, that's instigating. If you take Naaman's money and say you can cure him, even though you can't, what is that going to end in? It's going to end in a war. But if you tell Naaman we can't help you, even though there was a servant girl who assured him that they could, and now the king is withholding healing, well, what's that going to end in? War. <laughs> And so this is bad. This king is in a lose-lose situation. And understand that the king of Israel totally fails to seek the one who could help him. But this story is about Naaman. And notice Naaman's underlying assumption. His assumption is that God has to be bought. That's how the gods in his land work. That must be how the other gods work. God has to be bought. You have to earn his favor. But thankfully, Yahweh is different. Naaman is terribly wrong. God's help is not contingent on Naaman's gold. I just think about it. I mean, how absurd would it be to give God the gold that he created back to him to then gain his favor? That makes no sense. When someone borrows your tool and then hands it back to you, do you then give them a gift card to Lowe's and, you know, go buy more? No, of course not. Why would we, the created, ever think we have anything to offer God, the creator? Why would we think we have anything that would compel him to help us? God won't be bought, but he is willing to help. God is willing, even desiring to forgive and to rescue and to save you from the sickness of sin and death. But listen and understand this will not be because you earned it, paid for it, or deserve it, but because he is a gracious God. When it comes to salvation, you bring nothing to the table. The only thing that you contribute to your salvation, understand, is the sin that made it necessary in the first place. And so this is what God requires of those who would come to him. You come empty-handed. You have nothing to offer God. We're going to see next the second requirement for coming to a God of grace and it's that we believe and submit to his terms. Look at verses 8 and 9. So Naaman's there. Verse 8, But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come now to me, that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. Verse 10, and Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored and you shall be clean. Well, thankfully, one man knows what to do. It's not the king, but it's God's prophet Elisha. And Elisha sends word to the king, send Naaman to me. 
And Elijah comes into the story, and I want you to understand, Elijah steps in not to help the king save face. No, Elijah comes to defend God's name because of the faithfulness of that little servant girl. She said there was a prophet in Israel. Naaman came to Israel, and so Elijah is going to vindicate her words and her faith. In all of this, however, understand that God is interested in far more than healing Naaman's skin. He's after his heart. And his heart has yet to be humbled. In verse 9, having been summoned, Naaman brings his whole entourage to Elijah's house, which certainly was nothing like a palace. But notice verse 10, when Naaman arrives, what does Elijah do? Naaman pulls up, you know, black SUVs, bodyguards everywhere. He's got, you know, bags of money, briefcases. What does Elijah do? He doesn't even come outside. He doesn't even say hello. For the second time in this story, Naaman hears from a servant. And look at what he's told. The servant that Elisha sends out says, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. How embarrassing for Naaman. All his pomp and circumstance Naaman doesn't even get an introduction. Instead, a servant comes outside, tells Naaman to travel another 30 miles to wash seven times in a dirty river to become clean? What is this? Verses 11 and 12. But Naaman was angry and went away saying, Behold, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned away and went away in a rage. Naaman is absolutely beside himself. He came with his sealed letter in hand from the king, his letter of recommendation. He's got his gold, his silver, even those 10 changes of clothes. This man surely deserves a showing. Instead, he's sent away. You have to remember that from Elisha's perspective, Naaman is unclean. He can't even come within six feet of this man. But of course, Naaman did not see himself the way Elisha did, nor did he see himself the way God did. You see, what Naaman wanted was to be treated like a great man. What Naaman needed was to be treated like a leper. Naaman, wrote one commentator, had two diseases, leprosy and pride. The first needed curing as much as the second. Elisha's instructions exposed his pride. How could I, a great man, have to stoop so low to be saved? Is that not the same question today? Is it not pride still today that blinds a countless multitude to gloss over their sin and have no fear of God? You see, pride replaces God for you. And this is why God hates pride. Proverbs 16, 5, we read, The Lord detests all the proud of heart. Be sure of this, they will not go unpunished. Pride is utterly deceptive. C.S. Lewis wrote, Quote, I have heard people admit that they are bad-tempered or that they cannot keep their heads about girls or drink or even that they are cowards. I do not think I have ever heard anyone other than a Christian accuse himself of pride. Pride is contending for supremacy against God. And so what does pride look like today? What does it look like in our lives Well, how about when we reject God's clear word and choose our own way? How about when we complain over the circumstances of our lives as though we deserve something better? How about when we refuse to see the hurt we cause others and only focus on how they hurt us? What about when we consider ourselves above some certain task, but we're shocked and appalled when nobody else did it? How about when we're successful but we don't give God the glory. We wake up every day to homes with stocked refrigerators, air conditioning, 
a roof over our heads, all of these wonderful things that God has given us, but we don't for a moment give him the praise. How is that not contending for supremacy against God? As if we caused our hands to work, as if we caused our hearts to beat, as if we caused even the Son of God to leave heaven, humble himself, take on humanity, and die for our sins, as if we deserve that? No way. We need to not be deceived. You are absolutely nothing apart from God, and neither am I. Despite our pride, however, God, he's a God of grace. That's what this is all about. Look at verse 13. But his servants came near and said to him, my father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Has he actually said to you, wash and be clean? You see, thankfully for Naaman, he he has some good servants in his life. (laughs) Look, Naaman, it might be odd, but did you hear what the prophet said? He did say you would be healed. And what he asked, I mean, I get it. It's kind of unusual. It's probably not what we would have thought, but it's not hard. It's not even going to cost you anything. Verse 14, so he, Naaman, went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. You see, finally, Naaman was humbled, and finally, he obeyed, and what was the result? His childlike faith led to childlike flesh. Though it wasn't how he expected to be healed, Naaman persisted in faith. He submitted to God's terms, and he was cleansed. Do you think, in the end, Naaman regretted letting go of his pride? I doubt it. And understand, neither will you. You see, the gospel message is not complicating, but it does sound like foolishness. God became a man suffered on a cross, bore his father's wrath, died, was buried, and rose on the third day. Understand, you don't hear about people doing that every day, and yet I see people's lives being transformed by that message all the time. It happened, it's real. You see, the gospel might be foolishness to the world, but to us who believe it is the power of God, because if you are honest, You know that apart from Christ, you stand condemned before God. I have never met a person who would want their thought life turned into a movie and posted all over the internet. I never met that person. Why not? Because you know you are guilty of sin. And you know that unless someone else pays that fine, God owes you a punishment. His holiness demands it. And the punishment for sin is an eternity in the lake of fire. And your only hope is if someone else, someone perfect, someone innocent and truly righteous would love you enough to stand guilty and condemned in your place. Understand that 800 years after Naaman went into that dirty Jordan River, Jesus Christ went in there also. Not to be cleansed, but to identify himself with all the Naamans who would need cleansing, who are you and me. Jesus lived to be the righteousness that we lacked. He died for the sin we committed. He rose to secure our justification that we desperately needed. And this is the truth for those who would repent of their sin and believe in him. This text just pleads with you. Don't wait for a better message. Don't wait for a better day. This is the only message of salvation proclaimed to you this day. Humble yourself and believe it. We'll see the third requirement for coming to a God of grace is boast continually in your Savior. We come to verse 15, we find a changed man. God has transformed this proud commander now into a humble worshiper. And in these four and a half verses, we we find five new characteristics about Naaman, five new characteristics. First, Naaman has a new attitude. 
In the following verses, Naaman speaks to Elijah not as I'm some great man, but he now refers to himself as your servant. And he says that five times. Second, Naaman has a new confession. Verse 15, we read, Then he, Naaman, returned to the man of God, that is Elisha, he and all his company, and he came and stood before him, and he said, Behold, I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Naaman doesn't call Yahweh simply the God of Israel, but the God of all the earth. Third, at the end of verses 15 and 16, we see Naaman has a new gratitude. Naaman offers Elisha a gift. And certainly, Naaman, out of, out of an expression of his thankfulness, he offers Elisha a gift. Take something. Let me, let me offer something as a thanks to you. But Elisha has to refuse. Elisha says, as the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive none. You see, Elisha is careful to protect God's glory. Naaman is thankful, which is good, but his thankfulness must be di directed to God alone. In verse 14, or sorry, verse 17, we see a fourth new characteristic of Naaman, and that is that he has a new devotion. Verse 17, then Naaman said, if not, if you won't accept a gift, please let there be given to your servant two mule loads of earth. For from now on, your servant will not offer burnt offering or sacrifice to any God but the Lord. What a changed man. <laughs> First, Naaman scoffed at Israel's dirty water. Now, what is Naaman trying to bring back to his homeland? Israel's dirt. <laughs> he wants to build an altar to Yahweh with Israel's ground so he can worship his God, the one true God. And you need to understand that Naaman is going home. He's going home as a lone worshiper in a pagan land. And so this dirt for him is going to be a, a material and memorable connection to the people and power of his God. Now I just ask us, what about you? How much do you, who are a stranger in exile in this world, how much do you need continual reminders of who you are in Christ and what he has done for you? You go through a whole week hearing every other message than the message of the grace of God in Christ. Where could we ever go to find such reminders? Well, brothers and sisters, look around. Welcome to church. The church is God's gift to you. The church is our little slice of heaven's ground in a godless land. The church is an oasis for your soul. This is the gathering where against all the competing messages of this world, reality is brought forward week after week so that we do not forget there is a God who created the world, who sent his son, who died for sinners, who's alive today, who you trust, who you one day will see with your own eyes, bow before and worship. And so believers stand firm. Don't be ashamed. Link arms with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Whether there's few of us or many, we are called to boast in this Christ for, forever and together because we're his. We need these reminders. But fifth, look at this. Giving Christ our worship, it's not just a Sunday event. And Naaman quickly realizes this. As a high-ranking general, he's starting to think through the the implications of his life as he goes home. Yes, I need to worship Yahweh, but how's this going to play out every day? You see, Naaman's job requires his presence in pagan temples, the temple of Rimmon. And so Naaman, though it may seem disappointing at first, Naaman shows a fifth new characteristic, which is a new sensitivity to sin. Look at verse 18. In this matter... May the Lord pardon your servant. When my master goes into the house of Rimmon to worship there, leaning on my arm, and I bow myself in the house of Rimmon, when I bow myself in the house of Rimmon, the Lord pardon your servant in this matter. He, that is Elisha, said to him, Go in peace. Go in shalom. Well, that's interesting. This verse seems to 
undo everything Naaman just said. I'm going to worship Yahweh alone, except when I cave into pressure from my boss. Even more surprising, perhaps, is Elisha's response. Go in peace. What do we make of this? Well, first, I think we can thank God for not sugarcoating the characters in the Bible. And these are real people with real fears and real insecurities trying to live out their real faith just like you and I. Okay, but second, we have to appreciate the difficulty of Naaman's situation. In Naaman, we have a baby Christian going to a land with zero other believers whose livelihood, Naaman's, is connected to his job. Does all that mean we don't trust God? No, of course not. But for Naaman, at least in the immediate, the scenario he presents seems unavoidable. All he can do is ask for mercy. Naaman recognizes that it's not right to bow down to a false god. His new conscience is certainly working. That's why he's asking for forgiveness. But since going With the king to bow before Rimon is part of his job, at least in this moment, Naaman trying to piece all this together, what is this going to look like? He can't see another way forward. And so I ask again, well, well, then what what do we make of this? Well, the truth is, is we don't know whether Naaman ever did bow to Rimon. But here's what we do know. God was merciful to Naaman. And I think that challenges us. That has challenged me, and that probably challenges you. Because you know what? We want heroes. We want everyone to dare to be a Daniel. We want everyone to fearlessly face the lions, to never be a coward. And of course, that would be great, but the fact is, is that Daniel was over 80 years old when he was thrown into the lion's den. That wasn't day one or even year one of his Christian life. And we see this throughout scripture. The Peter who preaches in the book of Acts is simply not the Peter who denied Jesus in the Gospels. The Joseph of Arimathea, who was a secret disciple for fear of the Jews, that is not the same man who later takes courage and goes to Pilate and asks for the body of Jesus. Now, none of this is to make an excuse for sin. That is not the point. But it does serve as a reminder that it is right to be gracious, especially, I think this text is drawing out, it is right to be gracious to new believers. Their salvation and their aim is the same as yours, but understand, sanctification, it takes time. And so practically, what does this mean for us? First, I think we need to always remember Philippians 1.6. That he who began a good work in, fill in the blank, he who began a good work in that immature, still pretty worldly, immodestly dressing, Arminian, new believer, right? He who began a good work in them, what is he going to do? He's going to bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. If the spirit of God is in that person, he will conform them to his image, Well, what does this mean then for us? So we need to be patient with people. If you get irritated over an immature believer's immaturity, then let me ask you this. What does that say about your maturity? A mature response to immaturity would be to show grace. A mature response would be to prayerfully ask yourself, how can I, instead of getting annoyed at this person, how can I get involved in their life? Is that not what you needed when you were a new believer? Did you need someone to come along with the gift of nitpicking to expose all your faults? Right? Or did you need someone to step into your immaturity and point you to the one who gave his life for you despite all the ways you failed and still will fail? Fundamentally, what this is getting at is this simple question How do people change? How do people change? People change when they experience the grace of God. And so I just invite you, if, if you are thinking, well, I'd like some more opportunity with that, well, then come join the youth ministry. You are cordially invited. You want to be around new believers? Then come on. 
But that is a practical matter for each of us. How do we treat those younger in the faith? Well, the fourth requirement for coming to a God of grace is to beware of distorting his mercy. This final section really wraps together the message of this chapter. And just to summarize what happens, so Naaman goes off. He's happy. He's healed. He doesn't have leprosy anymore. But before he gets far, Elisha's servant Gehazi runs him down. Gehazi's greedy. Gehazi thinks that Naaman got off way too easy. And so Gehazi says to himself, note these words from the end of verse 20. He says to himself, as the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. Well, guess what? Gehazi is going to get something from Naaman. What an irony. And so Gehazi catches Naaman and he fabricates this whole story. Two young prophets just came and, and Elijah could use some extra money and clothing. It's a bold-faced lie. But of course, Naaman, having been healed of leprosy, he is quick to give twice as much as Elisha asked. And off they go. Ah, but then we come to verse 25. He, Gehazi, went in and stood before his master. And Elisha said to him, where have you been, Gehazi? And he said, your servant went nowhere. You just got to love that response, right? Dad, dad I have... No idea what you're talking about. Definitely wasn't me. Verse 26, but he said to him, did not my heart go when the man turned from his chariot to meet you? Was it a time to accept money and garments, olive orchards and vineyards, sheep and oxen, male servants and female servants? Therefore, the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and to your descendants forever. So he went out from his presence a leper like snow. Gehazi wanted to get something from Naaman, verse 20. Well, he succeeded, verse 27. He got his leprosy. Now, that's interesting in and of itself, but here's the real question that this last section poses to us. Why was Gehazi's punishment so severe? I mean, Naaman just walked away, pardoned in advance of a sin he might commit. Why did the Lord not give Gehazi a chance to run back after Naaman, pay back fourfold, confess and repent of his sin, and the story could end happily? Now, certainly Gehazi needed to to repent, but the Lord makes a severe example out of Gehazi because he does practically the worst thing imaginable, and it is this, Gehazi destroys grace. Understand that the whole point of Naaman's healing was that it was free. It cost nothing. That's the gospel. But, but, but Gehazi perverts the gospel, and he turns it back into a message of works. It's like the Galatian error in the Old Testament. How does he do this? Well, I have to understand that the ancient Near Eastern custom, it demanded what one commentator called, quote, apparent reluctance when accepting gifts. Okay, you, you know this drill because we do it too. Can, you, can I pay you for that? No. Are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. But I insist. I really want you to take something. No, I'm good. Seriously, like don't pay me back. But I know, I know you're good, but I really want to give you some. Okay, fine. Okay, fine. You know, if you insist. Well, well, we do that today. That was the custom back then. It was expected. But Gehazi's actions undid the whole message of grace. By asking for payment... Yahweh becomes just another needy deity. He's just another pathetic God who has to be bribed into his kindness. Gehazi committed the most serious error. He destroyed the gospel by making it a Jesus plus gospel. And just notice what a small thing it was he asked for. He didn't even ask for the gold. When he goes to Naaman, he only asks for one talent of silver and some clothes. His request seems so modest on the surface, and yet it destroys the entire message of grace. Even in Paul's day, the Judaizers, they too were modest. All they they wanted was the Gentiles to, to, to require circumcision for people to be saved. I mean, certainly that's a, a bit uncomfortable, but if your eternal salvation depended on it, that's not too much to ask. Neither would be requiring someone to be baptized to be saved or to give money or to read your Bible in a whole year, 365 days, or to be involved in the church, to be serving. But listen, none of those things, not one of those things saves you. And all of those things 
prayer, Bible reading, church attendance, baptism, you name it, if you make even one of those things a requirement for salvation, you will never be saved. You will forever be apart from Christ. You've destroyed grace. Galatians 2.21, Paul writes, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, i.e. if righteousness came through something we do, then Christ died for no purpose at all. And so we must be careful, even as believers, that we do not destroy grace by heaping things onto salvation other than faith in Jesus Christ. And just notice as we close, there is, there is one final contrast in this passage. One final contrast. You notice that the chapter began with a Gentile who was a leper. And that man found grace. The chapter ends, though, with an Israelite who became a leper, and he lost it. You see, Jesus himself in Luke 4, 27, he uses this account of Naaman to warn those who were so familiar with the truth, people like Gehazi, people like the Jews in Jesus' day, people like many who are sitting in church pews today, maybe even this morning, this text warns us that you can be so close to the grace of God and yet completely miss it. You could know all the truth, you could know all the right answers, and you could end up just like Gehazi, the leper, cast out of God's presence. And so I have to ask, is this you? Have you always thought that the one who needed mercy was someone else? Have you always thought that the one who really needed forgiveness was someone else? Or do you see that you are the one who is broken, sick, and in need of saving? You see, this morning, whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, it doesn't really matter. God has invited you to come. God knows who you are. He knows who you are. He knows you are struggling and in need of mercy, and yet because he is gracious, he invites you to come to him, to humble yourself, Call out to him and see that he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Let's pray. Oh God, we are just overwhelmed by how gracious you are to us in Christ. You who knew no sin became sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. For by grace we have been saved through faith. And this is not our own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And so God, draw us to you, not because of anything in us, but because of the work of Christ on our behalf. Lord, we give you all the glory, and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.